So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to be with us in this, uh, on this Friday's Sci Cafe talk. It's a great pleasure to have uh, one of the new members of staff of Hellenic Mediterranean University, Associate Professor Panagiotis Poligerinos. Uh, he belongs to the Mechanical Engineering Department of our university. A few words about the speaker, as usual. Uh, Panagiotis Poligerinos received in 2006 his bachelor degree, degree in mechanical engineering from the Technological Education Institute of Crete in Greece. Uh, he was uh, top of his class uh, based on his performance. In 2007, he joined for postgraduate uh, studies, master degree in mechatronics uh, in, from the Kicks College London in UK. Uh, he continued his uh, research as a PhD student in the same university, Kings College um, uh, of, in London. Uh, under the uh, funding and studentship and, uh, that he has received from the Physical Science Research Council and the Onassis Foundation. In 2012, he joined the prestigious and uh, the, one of the two top or, you know, among the top five universities in the world, Harvard University, uh, the School of Engineering. And um, uh, soon in 2015, he appointed a tenure track assistant professor in the, at Arizona State University. His work has received more than 6,000 citations and his age index is 25. Today, Panagiotis will talk to us about uh, the softer side of robots and their wearable applications. For the next 40 minutes, the floor is, your, is yours, Panos, and thank you very much for the honor and your contribution to Hellenic Mediterranean University Sci Cafe um, Colloquia Talks. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. I hope everybody can hear me well and you can see me as well. Uh, if anything goes wrong with my connection, just, just let me know and I will try and, um, and fix things for you. So uh, before I get started, um, soft robotics, right? Some of you might know what soft robotics is. Someone, some people might not know, you might have never heard about it. So I'm gonna try and, and, and get you up to speed with, with a few basic things but I'm not gonna go into giving a lecture about how soft robots work in reality. This is more like a presentation of, uh, of past work, overview of, of our past work. And by saying our, I mean that uh, every time that you see a robot being produced or a, a soft actuator or, or a soft system being developed, uh, you need to remember that there is a very, very large and very, very skilled uh, team behind it that has, has helped even, um, the work that I'm going to show you starts from uh, my, my time at Harvard, continues at my time as an assistant professor uh, in the US. And uh, many of the things uh, are just going to be sort of like brushed off in order to be able to get there and show you as much as possible in the, in the time that we have uh, ahead of us. So uh, the softer side of robots and their wearable applications. I'm going to speak about soft robots and how these can be used uh, effectively to enable uh, activities of daily living for people with impairment or assist uh, or enhance motion uh, of people that they are doing repetitive tasks that require them to do uh, such motions. But without further ado, I would always like to start with the following, just to set the expectations of what actually we are not going to see in this presentation, right? So this is, of course, from a movie, Marvel movie, Hollywood behind it shows that super uh, sophisticated uh, exoskeleton uh, device that is so makes makes the human being so powerful that can do many many things that the, we couldn't do otherwise. But this is not where we are today, right? Where we are today is more like this, right? This is the state of robots, unfortunately, to date. This is uh, an isolated environment from human beings. These are robotic manipulators working in, in factories, trying to perform repetitive, tedious tasks that are dangerous for the human beings, or sometimes that are even impossible for the human beings to do because of their nature, right? So we haven't even, we haven't reached the goal where we have robots in the sense that we have imagined them more in the sense that Hollywood has showed us so far, but I think we're getting towards this. There are challenges though to get there. And this is that we need to make humans able to work side by side with robots. And the way we, we envision the future are roboticists is that future robots will be able to interact directly with the humans. 
And we can see that in several different domains, right? Uh, industrial settings, we have recently seen robotic manipulators that are more advanced based on their uh, very capable um, algorithms and control systems to be able to work side by side with humans without being a danger for them. So we have today the technology and knowledge to have robots next to human beings in industrial settings and minimize the risk of injuries. We have also seen um, um, in the past few decades how robots could be assisting us in, in medical procedures, right? Like minimal invasive surgery, which is going through with miniaturized tools uh, through small incisions into, the, uh, into a person's body to perform a certain, a certain operation that would otherwise require uh, large incisions. So that means robots provide us with the dexterity, provide us with the ability to perform safer medical operations, working with soft tissue now, right? Working with a human being. And we have also seen the, the, the past few years, 10 years, 15 years or so, although it has started a lot uh, way back, uh, but recently we have seen a spike in, in the development of wearable robots, robots that assist either in rehabilitation scenarios or augmenting people's physical abilities um, with a goal to assist human motions and functions. But still, there is a, uh, something missing, and that is the mismatch we have between the robot and the human being, right? The skin is soft, the robot is, is made of those rigid components, and that doesn't really, really work. So if we use, again, uh, Hollywood as a predictor of the future, uh, a few years back, Disney uh, Labs created a, a cartoon that speaks about the first time for a soft robot, not a traditional rigid robot that can do everything. This is basically a robot that is made of inflatable uh, pouches that provides that safety between human and, and, and robot so that robot can interact daily with a human being and even pro offer hugs. People will say, Panos, are we here to for you to show us uh, cartoons and, and sci science fiction? No, actually not. This is actually, this cartoon was uh, inspired by a uh, CMU professor, uh, Chris Atkinson, that actually provided a lot of insights on how to make the cartoon be more realistic. And he's one of the professors that are, is working in the fields of soft robotics that I'm gonna be spending most of the time uh, talking today. And some of the prototypes that they made actually are trying to achieve this, robots that the human is able to interact, even hug them, right? We're not entirely there yet, but it's going towards that. So with that prelude, I'm I'm, 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 I would like to show you where engineers started getting inspiration to go towards softer type of robots, right? Here you see a soft, uh, a soft. you see an octopus basically uh, that intentionally is being put inside a, a transparent box at the bottom of, of a water tank. And there is only one opening for it to escape. And you see how it's changing its shape, how it's changing modifying its volume to actually managed to escape through that little opening. And that inspires engineers, right? That inspires scientists. Could we do the same? Why should we always have a rigid manipulator made of metals or plastics? Why should we have these, these heavy bulky systems that are super expensive and difficult to control? Can we achieve the same level of dexterity, the same level of, of flexibility in our systems? So this is how a few years back, the, the soft robotics um, subfield of robotics was created, right? It's a merger of how designers came to think about how things interact with a human being, engineers as well. Then scientists brought in new materials, new uh, chemistry, the biology got us the inspiration and the know-how of the biological systems. And somewhere in the middle, the soft robotics field was born. This happened uh, in isolation a, a few decades back uh, in Japan with some very uh, sporadic types of research emerging here and there, but it wasn't very concrete up until 10, 15 years or so that it started actually uh, uh, getting some uh, serious attention from the community and beyond. So, but why is soft robotics so important and has uh, raised eyebrows in the, in the past few years? And that is of a few certain things, right? That I'm gonna uh, speak very briefly about. So soft robots basically can offer delicate and compliant manipulation, right? They can grip, they can flexibly control objects that are fragile or deformable. 
by utilizing for the first time their, their entire body. And when, what I mean by this is, picture a, a traditional rigid robotic manipulator, right? It has all of those rigid links that are only able to bend at the, the, at the joints where the motors are. And it only uses the end effector, the end tool to actually grasp something. Imagine now yeah, that you can use the entire soft body of a system to actually hug, conform around an object and achieve manipulation of that. That opens up huge avenues to do things. So one other thing is the safe physical human robot interaction that I've been talking about since the beginning of this talk, right? Since these robots are made of flexible materials, soft materials like silicones, uh, polymers, uh, elastomers of some sort, uh, they are inherently safe for humans to work side by side or even to interact directly with the humans. The other thing that they offer is like the octopus, adaptable morphology. Their configuration can change according to what they interact with. And that is, that is huge in robotics. And also they can novel novel forms of movement like you see in this, in this picture. This is a quadruped, one of the first that, uh, that was created to actually create the, the, the awareness and that wave of research that, that's, that, start, that sparked uh, and started after, afterwards. This is a quadruped walking under a piece of glass by actually changing its shape and creating novel forms of movement that we haven't seen before in robotic systems. And finally, one of the most attractive things uh, is the, their inexpensive development, right? They can be engineered very easily at a very low cost because of the materials being used behind it. So in a nutshell, we are trying to take the intelligence from the control algorithms per se, and we are trying to put that intelligence into the materials. We're trying to say, how can we pre-program certain software materials to achieve goals for us? And this is uh, more or less what software robotics is here to do. Um, but for the, the, the sake of this talk and its title, I'm gonna be focusing how soft robots can be used in wearable robotics, right? So I have to spend a few more uh, seconds explaining the advantages of soft exoskeletons, right? We, we all, we, you might be aware of systems like I showed earlier that can be worn around the human being to augment physical uh, abilities or support uh, your motion if you have lost it due to a disease or impairment, right? These are again, so far been made using rigid components. Right now, there is, a, there is another trend that says, can we use soft robots to bridge the gap between the impedance mismatch of the skin, the tissue of the human being and the actual robot to have them be more or less as close as possible so the human being doesn't really feel obstructed, feel discomfort by wearing this type of robots as they assist them. So you see a collection down here of uh, some of them, unfortunately, it's not all inclusive, right? There is a, a lot of work happening right now and I'm just giving a glimpse of what's happening, all right? For example, we have uh, uh, Professor John Nasur over here as well, that he is working on soft robotics. And uh, at the end, we're gonna talk about something that it might be of, of more interest to him as well. But why do we wanna use these exosuits as we call them right now, not exoskeletons anymore? Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a new category. It's, it feels like a suit, something that you, are, you can wear on your body like you would wear your jacket. That's why they coined the name exosuits. Because once again, due to their nature, they are compliant. They bend as the body bends, right? They, they, they have a, a custom, they, you can have a custom fitting to each individual user because you don't need to worry about custom fitting that much, right? Soft robotics are forgiving in that regard, whereas rigid exoskeletons, you need to be perfect where you are aligning the rigid links. Otherwise, you're going to make uh, the life of the wearer miserable. So also, they are much lighter due to the materials, again, that they use. And as a consequence, they, they use less energy as well. They are easier to, easier to wear, and they can be worn concealed underneath clothing, something that we have seen as researchers that are working on the wearable field is that many people don't want to actually show out there that they're wearing something uh, that assists them because of the stigma that is out there. I, I think that that thing will change in the future years, but until now, people are a bit more reluctant to wear something that is bulky, clunky, makes noises, and uh, is, is definitely there. It attracts the eyes of people and they don't want that. So if you can wear them underneath clothing, that is an advantage. 
And also they are significantly less expensive. I, I shouldn't move on without saying that there are, of course, disadvantages. They are not the solution to everything, right? Exoskeletons are great to do certain things where have heavy uh, tasks are required to be achieved, whereas soft, ex soft exosuits are there to assist with uh, uh, providing some of the assistance, some of the motion where it's mostly needed, right? So some of the dis disadvantages are that because the main benefit of the soft robots is that you get rid of the rigid frames, the rigid links, but now you are making them the worst uh, part as well. Because everything is so floppy, so flexible, so compliant, you lose that, 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 that strength that you want the robot to have. So you need to recover that somehow later on with their activation. But that activation needs to come directly uh, from the power to the body and then to the ground, right? Motors and sensors, uh, will be more difficult, difficult to be interfaced with these soft systems if you want to actuate them. And also these torques and forces are now being transferred to the user's body. So we need to figure out clever ways to transfer the loads um, um, nicely, uniformly around the, the larger areas of the human body. Whereas rigid exoskeletons were able to just transform all the energy, all the loads directly through the rigid links to the ground. Right, so with that overview, uh, let's get into getting familiar with uh, some of the of soft actuators, as, as we call them, some systems that enable motions, right? In my talk, I'm going to stick only to present uh, soft, soft systems that are operated by uh, fluids, either uh, liquids or gases like compressed air. But that doesn't mean that the soft robotics field only, only works on that. There is a lot more areas if you are interested to, to, uh, to explore. So, Pneumatic networks, new nets in short. Basically, imagine that you have a silicon that you have been able to formulate in that particular geometry. There is a channel in the center, as you can see this cutoff view. And what happens is since the body is made of silicon, when you pressurize it, you actually generate a motion that is pre-programmed, as I said beforehand, uh, to the actuator by designing the actuator in that certain way, right? That nature of that motion is controlled by the geometry of the chambers. How is it made? We use 3D printers to create the negative part of those uh, actuators. And then we pour silicones that are still liquid. When they are solidified, we remove them from the mold. We adhere all the parts together and then we can inflate them, right? With that, as I said, is the key is the geometry, right? And here you see one of the first new nets that was introduced out there. And basically it has that certain type of geometry. These chambers where they inflate, one expands, the pressure has nowhere to go. So it starts st stretching the material. Each chamber stretches one another and the curly motion, the bent motion is, is being achieved. And then if we change the geometry ever so slightly and you see the difference if we focus uh, our attention here, right? These are chambers that are isolated, whereas here they are interconnected with silicon material. So what that means is by doing such simple chains in the geometry and how the, the, the system operates affects the energetics. Here you see some finite element modeling simulations that they check on the strain the material uh, experiences as, as it be, when it's been pressurized. And you can see that it's a lot more than uh, the other that doesn't have that extra stretchy material that needs to be expanded as well. And if we see the energetics in a bit more detail behind it, we can see that this system, of course, requires, first of all, a lot more pressure to be activated, to bend entirely, whereas the other one isn't. And the other, th the other thing that you see is that you require, you spend a lot more energy in, in order to activate it. So by doing that simple things, we're able to have different modes of operation for different applications. This might sound confusing right now why I'm focusing so much on this, but I'm giving you an overview of soft systems so you can see how we can use them again back into the main body of this, this talk, which is wearables, right? Here you see a lot more uh, models that we've created in the past. While I was working with uh, uh, Professor uh, Connor Walls at Harvard, Professor Whitesides, uh, from the chemical uh, department, chemistry department at, at Harvard as well. There is a lot more people behind it. Katia Bertoldi, 
I, I could go on and on and on. I couldn't thank them uh, enough for their contributions into this work. But coming back to what we were discussing, this is a matter of pre-programming, right? It's a matter of understanding your system uh, parameters, understanding that this is, has a certain uh, height, a certain length, a certain number of these chambers, and how this can affect uh, the, the system. So in order to avoid having to create a lot of 3D printed molds, making all of these different actuators to figure out which one is ideal for us for a certain application, we created those, um, uh, those models that you can very quickly on the software, in the software, change the parameters of interest to you, modify them, and see what happens in free bending or when interacting with, with objects, right? And we didn't stop there. We started exploring how this can be experimentally characterized, right? Okay, this is one of the first new net actuators that I showed you that it doesn't have separate networks uh, on the outer uh, cell of its body uh, compared to the other one that does. And what you can see is that if I pressurize them at the same pressure, focus your, um, your eyes on C and D images, you can see that for the same amount of pressure, the first one wasn't able to bend entirely, whereas the other one performed the 360 circle, right? And we were able also to use our models to get down to that conclusion. So you see this graph showing exactly that the blue line is the finite element modeling prediction and the camera data that we got from the actual physical experiment that you see for the same amount of pressure, 72 kPa in that particular example, we were able to follow the exact same trajectory and have the same more or less bending as, as we were having before. And we used that, we presented all of that, that knowledge also with uh, uh, Bobak uh, Mozadek, who is now at Cornell as, as, an, as an associate professor. And we put them all together in a nice uh, packaging. I don't know if you can hear the sound, but here we put four of these little new nets, the fast ones that require a lot less energy to actually play in a tune. Mary uh, had a little lump. So this, of course, is not showing the signs, but it, it raises awareness how these systems can actually perform fast. It was published back then in Advanced Functional Materials. It got also the cover. And the goal was to demonstrate just that, that this system can actuate rapidly, right? So we have the know-how not only to design them in the lab, but also to move that into uh, in more advanced ways and predict behaviors before fabrication. So moving on, let's get into the first uh, interaction of how these new nets, for example, can be used in an actual wearable application. And this is the soft glove that I'm presenting you right now, Harvard Biodesign Lab, led by Professor Connell Walsh and my time when I was doing my postdoc there and the VC Institute at Harvard. Our goal was, can we use these uh, soft systems to create the first demonstration of a wearable system? And uh, we went through several generations of developing the glove. The goal was, can we create a glove that is lightweight, is fast, is capable to generate the forces required to assist a user with some impairment, close their fingers uh, and do that at a clinic setting or even at home, right? So by using the new nets, we were able to create the first very crude demonstration of just that. Right here, you see the simplest form of that, which is, can we have four of them on top of the fingers glued on a glove and then still demonstrate with the softest hammering you have ever seen, of course, that these are compliant, safe, they don't break because they're made of silicon, but still they can achieve uh, some closure, some assistance for the fingers. By using all the models that we've created, by using all the experimental techniques that I've showed you earlier, we were able to go from that into something that looked a bit more streamlined and was optimized to generate the amount of forces required to basically perform some uh, first round of, of grasping, right? And that was published uh, back in 2013 in, in IROS. And um, it demonstrated that this can happen, right? But it wasn't enough. And because it wasn't enough, we went back to the drawing board and we said, how can we improve performance? How can we achieve higher forces out of these systems? And this is where we started exploring a new round of, of actuators, the fiber reinforced ones. And it, the best way to put, it, to put it out there is use, adopt the, the, some slides that some of, of our students have created in, 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 uh, in the past to demonstrate and explain this in simple words, right? And this basically imagine is the, 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 the soft actuator, the silicon is the pink part, the elastomer. And 
Now, if we cut it as a cross section and we see what would happen inside in a simplified version, the pink, as I said, is the elastomer and you have the air coming inside, right? The air is gonna start pushing all around the in inner walls. And because it's elastic, it's gonna start expanding. Panos, you will tell me, you didn't make an actuator here. You made a balloon, congratulations. I know, but this is the first principle of getting, getting us started, right? The goal here would be, how do I constrain certain parts of that actuator in order to achieve, to pre-program, as I said before, to pre-program the motion that I want this actuator to give me and not just inflate from all directions. And with that, we figured, can we put threads? Can we wind threads all around the outer cell so we can actually constrain the radial expansion that we don't want to achieve, right? Because it's a waste of energy. So here we are back again to our cross section, pink material, pink is the, the material, yellow dots here are the, the threads as they go around. And we have again, the pressurization. Now the system is pushing against the, the same walls, inner walls, but because of the constrainment, they cannot expand radially. And now you have made something that grows linearly. So now you have a soft linear actuator that could be used in several applications, but we didn't stop there. Let's constrain entirely one side of that actuator. Here is the cross section again, same thing. You have the windings, you have now an inextensible layer at the, at the bottom. You compress it, oops, sorry, my bad. You compress it and what happens is the system now starts curling because the top part of the actuator is able to stretch left and right. The bottom part is not able to stretch anymore because it's constrained from the inextensible layer. Radially, it cannot expand because of the threads. It has nowhere else to go but to curl. Right now, so we have, simpli we have simplified the geometry from the new net with all of those intricate uh, molds that we needed to, to, to have to, to achieve it to a single chamber that achieves the same thing which ma and can uh, accept much higher forces. And this is the, the beauty of it now, right? By changing how you put those constraints, you, you, we can create a recipe, uh, how to achieve different types of motions, right? You can have purely bending, you can have bending and twisting, you can have the linear extension, you can have the extended twist, so on and so forth. Sky is the limit over here. And by constraining, you can even segment the same single actuator. So now you have with a single input, multiple joints being created, which if you could compare it again with a rigid manipulator, we need, you need for each individual, individual joint that you have in a system, you need a separate actuation unit, you need a separate motor to put it that way. Whereas here, single pressurization input, you create all sorts of different motions that you can change even on the fly. So to reiterate, here is what we have constructed is elastomers with inextensible materials being put together that when they are pressurized, they, the lowest stiffness gives rise to extending, bending, twisting motion, so on and so forth. How do we make them? Similarly, we use, uh, 3D printed molds and the blue parts are the 3D printed ones. The pink is the material again. And when we have the first, we pour the silicones when they solidify, we start putting all the windings, all the inextensibility constraints that we want. And then we put it in a secondary mold, 3D printed mold to secure everything in place with another thin layer of silicone. We cap the two ends, the lower, the upper and the lower. We put a vented screw so we can allow the air to go in and out. And here you are, you have a system now that does everything that we saw before. This is great on the bends, right? But we needed all, we felt also the need to create models that predict the motion of these things because otherwise we would be spending uh, hours and hours, not, not say days and months, developing in real life uh, all of these actuators, all of those molds to see whether or not a small change that we made in one small parameter achieves a different design. So we created analytical models um, that actually investigate different cross sections that they investigate, take into account all of those parameters that affect the performance of these systems. And we create a recipe through these analytical models for uh, the, 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 the community out there to say, hey, what, what will happen if I change the diameter? What will happen if I change the length? How can I predict what will happen if I change the thickness of the material or even the material itself? And then we concluded that work, that analytical modeling on, those partic on this particular type of actuators with a lot of controls, right? Is this accurate to be controlled? Now we're talking about non-linear systems because of the material that need to be modeled and then later controlled if we want them to have some, um, 
some outcome in the robotics realm. So we managed to, to demonstrate the first, some of the first models out there. I'm not claiming we did everything right. There is, as I said, again, a large community out there working feverishly in these type of systems today, and they have done uh, giant leaps. Uh, but this is what we succeeded back then. And it's so that we can do stable controlling of these, these systems. And again, we created finite element models for these ones that we open source, open sourced through, through the soft robotics toolkit.com initiative from Harvard University. So all of everything that I'm talking about here, you can find uh, ways to make them online and uh, they are open sourced for everybody that has an interest to, to, to doing them. So by combining, once again, the analytical models, the finite element models and the experimental characterization, we demonstrated that we have a nice um, prediction beforehand and nice development afterwards. So basically what it shows in the middle over here, this graph, it shows three lines one is the finite element model prediction. The other is the experimental, what actually happens in reality. And the other is the analytical model prediction. You see there is a close uh, match uh, with that. So we can now create our actuators the way we want them. So breathe in, breathe out. Let's go back to the soft glove, generation one, right? To re refresh your memory, we, we saw the glove been operating with new nets. Let's see what happens if we start putting uh, this type of actuators now, the fiber reinforced. Welcome to generation one. And since we had all that analytical knowledge, we needed to match these actuators to the motion of the finger, right? We have, each finger has three degrees of freedom, three joints that we needed to match for each particular user out there. So we used that analytical knowledge that we had, how much the material will stretch if you pressurize it in such a such way. And we created a very quick way to go over, over a user take a picture of their hand over that uh, grid paper, and then provide that to a software that we made to have an analogy, to have a, a matching of the physical uh, sizes of the human hand to how the actuators need to be actually developed, what lengths and then sizes need to be. So we use that to our advantage, and we created the first iteration of that. Up here on the left uh, corner, you see only the thumb been assisted. And this is by making an actuator, a fiber reinforced actuator that at, at its base, it's matching what the thumb is actually doing, which has one joint that bends and twists in parallel in order to close and grasp something, right? So we achieved that single pressurization input, but the fibers, the windings, the constraints were made in such a way that the actuator will perform at its base a slight twist and bend motion. And then there's gonna be one more joint at the top that is gonna bend the, the, the remaining of the finger. And then we took that and we put another four fingers for the rest for the remaining of the, the fingers of the hand. And we created the first interface that you see over here. Also, we need to start working on how we can actuate the systems. So, and be also portable because don't forget the goal with a glove was to give it to a user that has an impairment, take it at home, right? So all of the electron pneumatics in there, because this is operating with compressed air and the particular one with compressed liquids, compressed water, basically, we needed to have a small pump. We needed to have the battery that provides energy to the pump. We needed to have the valves that open and close. And all of these need to happen in a, in a lightweight system. So we put it nicely, I believe, back then around the waist of a human being. And we started performing grasping motions. We went and started a study with impaired participants. So we got their consent to show what we are showing you over here. For example, this is the hand of a user that has muscular dystrophy. And we, we, we started doing some studies to demonstrate that the user beforehand is having troubles actually grasping. This is a, a grip meter that physical therapists use to, them, to measure how much energy strength you have on your, on your grasping. And you can see the, the, the scale didn't register anything but zero. Right? The user was trying hard, but there's nothing anymore there for her to give. So we very crudely took the first iteration that we had in the, in, the, in the lab. We went there and we said, okay, let's put it around the user's two fingers and see, can we create an opposing thumb grasping? And we started pressurizing, you see, not even with the, the, the controls. We were very careful at that time with just simple yeah. bike pumps, what right? Wow. Once again, I'm not sure if you can hear the, the, the commentary behind. From the yeah, you user. can hear it. You can hear okay. it. Okay. So the user basically says she's excited to be able to pinch again to perform the motion. Less human that I can't. 
I don't have an opposing she, she felt like she wasn't a human enough that she wasn't able to do that opposing motion. But now, even that doesn't demonstrate that she can use it in her everyday life. Still, it shows, demonstrates to her that, oh, I can do the motion again after I don't know how many years, right? And that takes us to soft glove generation too. That was great. It showed us that it can be done. Fiber reinforced accelerators was at that time the way to go. And we wanted to streamline them, to streamline, streamline them. We wanted to make them thinner, but yet more powerful. So that's what we did, generation two. And at that point, I need to say, we have started encountering a, a huge need to interface these actuators with a human body, and in particular, the, the hand at that time. And we started exploring different fabrics, uh, different fabrics that they stretch one way, but they don't stretch in the other direction, that they are woven, they are stitched, they are so many different terms that as an engineer, I didn't know at that time. So we collaborated with functional apparel designers to talk us through this. And we went through several sketches, several iterations to figure out how can we achieve a glove that is breathable, that can be washed, that can be worn by the user, that has the impairment in a much easy, easier way, that it's not gonna make the palm sweat, that can accept the forces and transfer the forces to the hand, right? And not just have the actuators bulge over the hand. And with that, we actually made the generation two that looks a lot, a lot uh, more streamlined. And we made a nice control box to allow us to, to do all sorts of different experiments. It has all the electronomatics in a, a small form factor to carry around. And with that, we went to that one user back uh, that had muscular dystrophy. And you can see here what the physical therapists call the box and block test. Blocks on both sides, you need to take them from one side over that obstacle and put them on the other side in 60 seconds. And this is a measure of how well a user can do things. We did it without and with a glove. And to be able to let go. I have as much trouble letting go of things as I do picking them up. So we demonstrated that the user was able to qual qualitatively at least pick up more blocks and, and do things a lot, a lot better than before. What you don't see over here is, here's the box that I to told you about. You don't see how the, the glove is being actuated. Here is me standing on the side. And when the user is over the block, I'm basically pushing a button and say, okay, now close the glove and now open. Which took us to the next level of our research questions to be answered for soft systems. Okay, how do you control them? And how do you give the ability to the user to control them? Right, and how do you prove that the actual, actual glove does the work when you have coupled it with a human hand, right? People were a bit um, cautious to accept whatever they see and I, and I can understand that. So we did the first experiment that says, uh, okay, let's put some uh, EMG sensors. These are surface uh, electrodes basically that measure what's happening uh, at your muscle level underneath your skin, how much energy has been provided to that to, in order to close your, your, your fingers. And if we stick only to the second part that is filtered, you can see this is the, the user actually been flexing the fingers in order to pick up a tin can of uh, 500 grams. And this is how much energy you require to the extensor muscles on the other side up here to actually release that. And then we said, okay, let's now put the glove on and do the same, but without activating the glove. We still wanna demonstrate, um, this is without the glove, sorry. This is the actual baseline. This is what happens if you, you don't have the glove and you wanna pick the 500 uh, grams tin can. This is, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm forgetting things. This is what's happening um, when you actually perform the maximum uh, grip strength that the user has. And this is what's happening when you're lifting, you're using some of it to lift the 500 grams ob uh, object. And this is what's happening when you have the glove do the motion for you. Basically it stayed flat at zero. That means the glove took over for you and it just guided your fingers and used the finger friction to actually hold it in place. And then, as I said, we need to figure out user intent. So again, we liked how EMGs were working. So we collaborated with Myom, a company that makes a small exoskeleton system for the elbow uh, based in Massachusetts. And they lend us their EMG sensors to actually use them this time, not to measure what's happening only, but to use it as an input to control the glove. And this is what you just saw over here. It's like, me giving just a tiny input through my muscles, my intent to the glove, making it know, making it aware that I want to grasp something and basically grasping it by the glove. And then we took it to the, to the user and here you can see how much different and 
more difficult things can become. And this is the reality. We assumed in the lab that, oh, we made the, the cleverest uh, algorithm that predicts when the user wants to do something by using that muscle signals, and we can put it, transfer it directly to the user. No, it's not that easy. That user, don't forget, has muscular dystrophy. That means the muscles have weakened. So it was so much harder to even identify the tiniest signal over there. So we had to do a lot more work and then go back and simplify our approach in order to, to provide the user with the ability to grasp. And here you see that cuff that measures that signal and the glove actually being activated by the user uh, entirely, right? Opening and closing. And at the bottom, I'm showing you how those signals more or less uh, perform, right? Here is the, the same user on her own for the first time after years grasping something. There is no me anymore flipping switches. It's all her doing it with her volition. That basically, before I close, I need to say that after I left uh, to, to start my own uh, academic uh, research lab, uh, after I left Harvard, there, there was a huge, large number of, of researchers that, 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 that took over the glove and it, they took it to a whole different level. They, they, they were awesome, great at doing that. And recently, the last year actually, the, the, there was a startup that sp spun out of Harvard called Imago Rehab that is taking is attempting to take that glove to actual users out there. So that makes me proud that I was part of the initial steps, but of course, all the kudos. And if you are interested on where this glove can be used, you need to follow these guys in Mago Rehab. Uh, uh, so going back into our actuators to demonstrate more systems, and it's gonna have a much faster pace now because I know that the time is running out, right? Fabric-based soft actuators, right? Silicon is great. It has some limitations. It's great for some applications, but not as great for others. For wearables, we came across fabric, uh, fabrics that are able to be heat sealed in certain ways and then inflated to allow us to do things. And here I'm showing a very small uh, rudimentary design of an almost rectangular pouch. This is a thermoplastic urethane, a film basically, that we heat sealed around the, the, the seams, around the ends, and then we put an input for the air to go in and out. And then what we did is we put it around, we encased it and stitched it uh, in a nylon pouch. So we basically made the, the tire of a bicycle or, or, or a car, right? You have the, the, the elastic uh, inside that inflates, but it's been constrained by the, the outer cell. So it doesn't explode and allows to accept the, the, the forces from the environment. So on the left, you see that pouch on its own being inflated at 40 kPa. And at some point the material will give because that elasticity ex makes the, the pouch expand. But then again, by encasing it, we were able to go 10 X the pressure and achieve high stiffness of that same system. So it's not entirely an actuator on its own. It's just a pouch that inflates and changes its stiffness. So from zero stiffness, we go to extremely high stiffness, which, which was of interest to us. So we started exploring different, um, different designs over here. So we made it into a cylinder. So you have, again, the same pouch inside a textile, and then you inflate it. When you inflate it, it becomes rigid, right? It's, it's difficult to, to even bend sometimes. And according to, to your application, you could use that. And then the minute you remove the, the pressure, as you see on the video, the whole thing can be entirely transparent, can be collapsible, right? And it's just a piece of fabric that thing we couldn't uh, live alone. We wanted to do more things. So we started exploring different geometries of how these pouches can be made. Here you see uh, a flexible one that is made like the new net, a pleated structure that when you inflate it bends, so on and so forth. But let's go and see how this was able to, to open up a whole new avenue for assisting users with wearables. So let's see how these fabric actuators were used to extend your knee, right? This is a basic graph that shows um, the, the gait cycle, how we walk basically. What are the, the steps involved into performing one step, right? There's the, the, the stance phase where you put your, your foot on the ground and then there is the swing phase where you actually swing your knee forward to clear the ground and perform the next step, right? Imagine now that you have an impairment and you cannot really do that particular motion because you had a stroke, now your half side is half paralyzed and you are dragging your foot on the ground. You need to clear it somehow. So we envisioned a system like that, that can be 
that has all the electronumatics again on a, on a waist belt or on a, on a pouch somewhere. And you have these sleeves that are transparent when they are not active, but very rigid and they can provide a certain type of motion when, when you want them. And here is that first version that we created, right? We took these of the, two of these tubular actuators, we put them inside these pouches, a nice interface around the body to be able to transfer the forces, some soft sensors inside the insoles to measure where we are at the gate cycle. And basically we start performing uh, experiments to see how this be behaves. I'm gonna go a lot faster because I can see Mr. Petridis coming up. And uh, for the sake of time, this works nicely, inflates, follows your gait. It's great. We created se several generations of that. We did several studies to prove that it actually assists. And I'm not gonna go into details, a lot of EMG studies with multiple users, impaired users. We demonstrated that it can assist you while walking, right? And I just wanna show this quick video very fast. An impaired user with Barron Neurological Institute in Phoenix that we're collaborating with, only we have provided these, these systems on their knee and we were doing the sit to stand, the sit -to -stand uh, experiment. In the beginning, the user was doing it on her own. And then all of a sudden we activated the system and the user in the end says that she was able to feel the assistance. I'm just going faster now than the video just to, for the sake of time, right? And we jumped then into putting these systems into the elbow, right? And Professor Nasur, that is, uh, was very kind to join us today, is, is working on similar systems and has proven that actually, actually these systems uh, are effective. Uh, this is taking these initial small pouches, stacking them in a parallel formation, and then having one push the other, and from a very compliant system, go into a very, very, very stiff system that you cannot even open when it's pressurized. It's, it's becoming extremely tough. And what you do, you assist the elbow motion of an impaired user or a worker, worker or whatever you can imagine out there. We did several studies again to prove that the system is doing the work and not the user. And we continued even further to take in, into the ankle. New systems, I'm just gonna go directly to the videos that are being interfaced to not only assist your knee, but assist now the ankle motion, right? Provide that clearance to the ground by lifting, doing the dorsiflexion of your ankle as, as, as it's been called with these new type of, of soft actuators that are made to contract and pull upwards uh, your toes, right? And it's an easy don and doff system. And this is basically how it works, right? It's been fitted on that soft system uh, around your, your foot. And when it's contracted, it's, it's helping you clear the ground. And we did several studies on that. Finally, the last video, and I'm closing up, it was great to see how systems can be worn, be worn directly on, to assist joints of the human body, but what if we could have soft limbs, additional limbs to help us? There, is a, there, is, there are a lot, of, a lot of studies out there from uh, neurobiology that indicate that a user is able to uh, create new uh, synapses in their brain and learn how to operate additional systems. So we were exploring that possibility as well. Can we have a soft system that is lightweight, uh, able to be put on around, let's say, your waist, that is one particular example, and when it's deflated, is collapsible, but when it's coming out and then you inflate it, it starts moving, right? And it demonstrates how these fabrics can be developed to create these robotic manipulators that are basically very strong, but yet very easy to manufacture and collapsible, able to withstand a lot of weight, to support a lot of weight by just means of air pressure, right? And now we are able to do what we weren't able to do before with rigid manipulators, right? being able to conform around the object by using the entire body of the manipulator. So with that final slide, I promise future research vision. I want to try and get to as many other researchers out there, right, into this. Can we have soft, wearable, adaptive garments, as I call them? The, the acronym is SWAG, which I like. And the idea would be we need to do a lot of more research into textiles, functional textiles, figure out how we can use them to our benefit to create soft actuators, to figure out how can we have them underneath our clothing and be so discreet and transparent, but yet so powerful. And how can we sense and control the user motions with soft, flexible also sensors and also use uh, fluidic systems to provide that energy to that system and use the data collected to augment physical capabilities, to assist workers, to provide immersive haptics because the, the world is changing and we're going towards that. 
to provide assistance to the ever aging population of, of, of our planet, right? And, and assist the silver economy. And also maybe provide resistive training even for simulating uh, gravity uh, in space. So with that, I would like to, to thank again all the collaborators out there, my previous PhDs, Sai and Berm, that they did a lot of work on, on these, or some of the things that you saw, and, and, and many, many, many others that it would take me forever to, to thank, and I'm ever grateful. Thank you for being here and for hearing me. Thank you very much, Panagiotis, for this impressive presentation and uh, a glance in the future. Um, so we are ready for the questions. Um, let's give the floor first to the audience. Many congratulations to the, to the School of Mechanical Engineering for the pickup. I like very much basketball, so I think that you have drafted a very good scientist. Uh, impressive. I have some questions. Um, you can write your questions to the chat or you can switch on your microphone and direct the questions directly to uh, the speaker. Uh, in order to help me to moderate the questions, please raise your virtual hand in the reactions button and uh, then we are going to direct the questions. Until you know we have questions from the audience, let me uh, direct to you, Panos, some, some of the questions that I have. Sure. I have two questions, mainly, I, I don't know, you know how many, you know, I have noted some of them. Um, the first question that I have with you is like, how much a complementary is like uh, the mechanical part that you have presented to us? Like, you know, with all these assistive tools uh, that you design that comes from outside to facilitate the motion of the humans with the bioelectronics, because using uh, other kind of uh, research that has been presented through the Sci Cafe, from Professor Malaras from Cambridge, they are using bioelectronics to control all these motions through the brain, uh, sending you know the appropriate signals. So, how much complementary can be these two technologies? So, to facilitate, let's say, the bioelectronics bioelectronics impact to the motions using these uh, mechanical facilitators. This is the no, first I, question. I totally agree. It's, they they are complementary. One needs the other, right? We haven't. I'm, I'm not claiming we have figured out the, the holy grail of how to detect user intent, right? How to understand what the user wants to do and have the robot assist you doing it, right? Whether it's rigid or soft. Uh, so systems like Professor Mayaras, as, as you mentioned, uh, that are uh, soft optoelectronic devices or miniaturized versions of that that are able to grasp directly the signal from the brain would be ideal, right? If we can hack that, then we will, th the whole field will be unlocked, right? It's gonna be much easier to do things. Uh, for the moment, we are exploring a, a lot, a lot of avenues like surface EMG. Ideally, would be to go directly inside the muscle to do that, but this is sort of invasive. There are ser several groups out there that are going directly with implants into your brain to actually acquire the signals from over there. And there, there has been a lot of research lately for amputees where they go directly on the residual limb on the stump and they implant electrodes directly there to get the signals from the neurons. Uh, that are uh, s stemming from the brain. And definitely s uh, the new developments in, um, in science and technology that are making all of these uh, electronic systems smaller, much more accurate, less invasive, and uh, they, they are gonna unlock the field of assisting uh, human beings with exosuits or exoskeletons. So we need it, yeah. And the second question that I have is the following. You mentioned that you are using air pump, uh, air pump uh, assisted kind of motions. So you're using the pressure that is generated through air uh, supply uh, in order to control the motions in combination with the structure, as we have seen through your talk. Uh, I would like to say, ask to you, what about the piezoelectric properties of these kind of elements? And instead of having the air to pump and control the motions to use electrical signals in order to using the piezoelectric element, pro, uh, the piezoelectric property to control this kind of motions, which is I suspect faster, you know, as a reactions, and then we can move to opto to light assisted kind of if this is possible. What is your perspective on this? No, no, this is a great question actually, and it comes back uh, to what I want to emphasize that by with this talk right one of the points uh, that i made but i wanted to 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 reiterate it is that because i presented pneumatically driven or hydraulically driven systems soft systems that doesn't mean that everyone is doing that there are other groups that are working on uh, piezo actuated soft systems uh, electroactive polymers 
uh, that are being used out there as well to perform uh, such such type of uh, achieving such such type of soft systems. So definitely, we could even see. Uh, I could predict most likely that systems in the end, the soft systems, when they the, the dust settles and we have the, the the winners, if I may call them that that way, of the technologies that are going to be more suited for wearables, for example, uh, are going to be a hybrid solution. They're going to be something that interfaces some. Uh, some of that technology, some of this technology, and they come in synergy together to actually generate the motions you require. The pumps have one negative aspect, which is the, the, the higher pressures and the higher flow you require, the bigger the pump needs to be. So we're working on that uh, realm as well. The benefit being that with one pump, you can actuate all the systems on your body, whereas otherwise you would require several motors, but definitely electro activated systems, piezo or otherwise, uh, are also a way to go. I agree. Thank you very much, uh, Panagiotis, uh, for the answers. Uh, please, please um, do have any questions from the audience to Panagiotis. This is the time to ask. I think everybody's overwhelmed uh, and, and tired because I, I saw way too many things. It, it, it's the first time you see these things, you need to to digest them first. Uh, uh, I, there is a question from Professor Nasur. Uh, Professor Nasur, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much for the for the presentation. It is really impressive and I really like it. Please, uh, uh, Professor Nasur, introduce yourself to the audience because this is also a networking event, no? OK, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, uh, first of all, I'm not a professor. I'm a senior researcher at the Technical University of Munich. And I also work on software robotics and mainly on textile based robotics. And I think the, the work that has been presented today was in the past uh, few years, uh, a source of inspiration for me to uh, improve uh, and to work on the software robotics. So I really uh, acknowledge uh, Panos for the work and for all the papers that has been presented, which was really interesting. And uh, but this actually relays always many, many questions as a researcher. So. Uh, first of all, um, I mean, I really like the idea of fiber reinforced actuation because uh, you you design the fiber and then you can have different uh, behaviors in in the actu in, in one single actuator. Uh, the point I found is this: like you have like several sections, and each section generate one behavior, which is really great. Uh, depending where you wanted to place exactly this actuator. But given the complexity of the human body, we may need to have different behaviors in a one single section. So uh, what is your perspective? How can, uh, what should we use? I think silicon maybe is not a good, uh, uh, maybe, I, I don't know about the perspective of that, but maybe uh, given what you presented with softwareable, uh, with textile-based actuators, that could be uh, one of the solutions. But still, how can we have, uh, how can we bring versatility to, uh, to uh, this kind of soft-based, uh, uh, textile-based actuators? So that is my first question. So this is a, a question that, uh... We, we, we could open up a discussion for, for many, many hours. I'm going to try and distill it down uh, as, as fast as I can. So this is one of the main uh, things that everybody in software robotics is trying to achieve right now. And I'm guessing you are as well, right? You have one piece of actuator that is pre-programmed to achieve a certain motion. You interface it with the human body in a certain way. But then again, you want it at the right time to perform a slightly different motion. So you want to program it on the fly, online. Right, and that might necessitate if we're talking about textile uh, driven systems, maybe over there some functional textiles could create a hybrid system right, you have your main pre programmed motion the bulk of the strength is being taken by pneumatics, but then there are these new constraints all around that are activated, let's say by means as uh, Mr Petridi said from um, some electrical means, and this makes the fibers let's say contract or stiffen up or loosen up and that might enable a slightly different motion when you need it be right so that that could accommodate um, minute differences in uh, biomechanics for human beings if we're talking on wearables or different types of motions if we're talking of other robots i have seen uh, many many groups not many several groups lately coming up with um, uh, phase controllers something that you don't really need to change the the, the actuator per se but it changes the cycle on how the, the air pressure, let's say, is being distributed. 
to achieve certain, certain types of motions. And the other thing that we have also uh, have seen back then with Professor Whiteside's group and uh, Bobak uh, Mosadek from Cornell right now uh, was that, and Rob Seppert from Cornell as well, was that the, 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 the speed of actuation plays a role in the actual motion that the system will perform. Right? If we're talking quasi-static, something moving very slowly, inflating the system very slowly, it's going, for example, create a be pure bending motion. But if you rapidly provide that, that, that burst of pressure, you can create a completely different uh, output motion from the same system without even changing anything. So controls would play a role, I believe. How do you interface functional textiles that can change how these constraints affect the system might be two of the ways that, that I would um, start with. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have, ask last question? Yeah, go ahead. Ah, because I have you. another one myself. <laughs> yeah. So um, my last question will be, uh, how long it takes you to move, or, or it takes you think to move the glove from the proof of concept to the market, to the time that it can be commercialized? Okay. Uh, you're putting me on a, on a time machine now. I'm going back to uh, the first iteration came to be 2000, end of 2012. We didn't publish it yet. 2013, let's start there. And now we are 2022 and barely last year, the, that startup spun out of Harvard. So eh, it's a decade, right? Okay. It's not easy. It's not easy. You have, and of course, it, it, we weren't putting all of our strengths only on that particular glove. And there is, uh, depending on where you want to go with the glove, it might take you longer or less. And to give you a quick example is if that company decides, because I don't know, what they're going to do if they decide to go let's say for the uh, for workers to assist workers they might not need to jump all the hoops in their in their research to demonstrate the efficacy of actually being helping a stroke patient or a muscular dystrophy patient which requires a lot of more approvals and ethical boundaries to be kept uh, the way they have to but if if you are to go that route, then you have to, to solve all these problems first and that will take a lot longer. So if it is a medical application, to, to put it plainly, it's gonna take a lot longer. If it is just uh, not a claim that you're making like, oh, I'm going to uh, help you reduce metabolic cost by 20% by wearing this system, but it's like, I'm gonna help you in your everyday tasks. The claims you make change how fast you go to the market and what team you have behind, behind you, right? That, that plays also a role. Uh, I'm interested in, in, this, in these questions myself, right? How, how do we commercialize that? How do we don't only do research in the isolation of the lab, but we translate it out there in the market? And hopefully I'm gonna be able from my research right now in a few years back to have something to demonstrate on that regard. But today, yeah, roughly five to 10 years is the way to go because you have to go through several things. It's not only the engineering behind it, right? It's a lot of, a lot of other things that need to come in place. There is a market need, there is the, the funding, there is, you know, you know how it goes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And the last question, Panos, um, mainly inspired by John's uh, question. It's like, all, I mean, you need flexibility. And you mentioned that you are using silicon in one of your systems. So we know a part of John Rogers in Urbana that demonstrates flexibly, flexibility on silicon substrates and silicon based devices. I mean, there is an issue. Uh, regarding how flexible is the silicon before you know the material will be degraded uh, how do you i mean do you think do you agree with this or you have managed to use you know like you, to demonstrate this flexibility based on silicon or you are thinking of other materials that combine properties of silicon but also they are characterized uh, with flexibility for example graphene even though that graphene does not demonstrate i mean if it's not a single layer you know the electrical properties of silicon what is your position on this no, that's a great question. Um, I'm not a material scientist, right? But because of the field that, I'm, that I have joined, I have interacted a lot with them, but I cannot go in depth into claiming that I understand all the materials. To answer your question is, there are several groups out there that are looking on different types of materials. For example, the silicons that we presented here today are what we call, they, they, they belong into the category of hyperelastic silicons. That means you can stretch them a lot, and then they can return back to their initial uh, length without having any permanent damage. And you can do that repeatedly without fatiguing them. That's the, the benefit of that. They can strain a lot. Uh, other types of, of materials like that, it's hydrogels, right? They are uh, 
there is a, a huge number of, of people out there working and exploring how hydrogels can be used in robots or other applications. Graphene might be interesting to do. I don't personally know anybody that is doing it currently. And if they are, we will hear soon, I guess. Uh, but yeah, all these are possibilities. You could use all sorts of different materials to achieve what you want for your particular application. I'm an applications driven researcher. So I like to somehow to merge what I'm doing for uh, the science part into an actual application that might help someone uh, or assist someone in that regard. But there are way too many materials out there and a lot of researchers currently exploring it. So we will see a lot of advances uh, coming out soon, I'm guessing, or the years to come. Thank you so much, Panagiotis, for the thank presentation. You. A lot of nice comments on the chat for you for you know this I kind of everyone, presentation. I will give the floor to. I think that our rector also is very proud of the new staff uh, that is employed in our university. I don't know, Nikos, if you would like to say something as a final word, not the final, because the final will come with me about a, a presentation that we will have on Monday from Stanford University regarding the impact of engineering in uh, our daily life but I will present you a little bit before the closing. So the floor is to our rector. So once more, uh, congratulations Panagiotis for this uh, great uh, work and for this inspiring presentation. I'm very, uh, let's say, delighted from your presentation. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, very inspiring. And I have to tell once more that uh, Panos uh, Polygernos uh, started his studies from uh, TE of Crete. And uh, we are very proud of this because uh, his uh, uh, work uh, in King's College and then Harvard University in the US. And then he came back and uh, mechanical engineering department uh, picked him up and he is now an associate professor in the mechanical engineering department of the Hellenic Mediterranean University and really Panos we are very proud of you thank you very much for this talk thank you very much for your kind words I'm proud too thank you thank you everyone before we uh, before we finish let me also uh, uh, share with you the next talk that we're going to organize in collaboration with the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, it's on Monday. I mean, I, I hope that you are very fond in love, not only with your wives or your husbands on the 14th of February, but also with science. We are going to have together with us online, of course, Professor Yanis Yorchos. Professor Yanis Yorchos is a Dean of the Viterbi School of Engineering at the University of South California in the US. And he's going to present us engineering a better world for all the humanity. The, the talk is organized by the School of Engineering of Hellenic Mediterranean University in close collaboration with all the schools of engineering in, uh, in Greece uh, under the coordination of the National Technical University of Athens. So the talk will happen uh, at uh, five o'clock. Uh, here you can find on our uh, uh, website uh, of the International Relations Office, uh, the URL of the YouTube channel, but I will send you an email uh, later on. And for the next Friday, we will have Professor Stavroulakis. He's going to speak about neural networks for direct and um, uh, inverse, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, new, uh, neural networks for direct and inverse problems in mechanics. Uh, but you know, more emails will come from um, our office and our unit together with Professor Kavoulakis uh, for, the few, uh, for the next uh, talks. So uh, when I go this once more, thank you very much. The people that you have missed uh, this uh, impressive uh, presentation, you will have the chance to follow our YouTube channel where the stock will be uploaded. So thank all of you and see you on Monday uh, and on Friday, I hope. Bye-bye uh, and take care. Bye.